how do you make comics without all the frustration, without feeling lousy and inadequate all the time? Join me, Jess Rolipson, and me, Tom Hart, on The Terrible Anvil. Each week, we build community and shift our mindset about what it means to make comics and art. We're working through the whole process, one piece at a time, turning our suffering and angst into fun and glee. Join us at sawcomics.org. Here we are. It's episode six of The Terrible Anvil. I am your host, Jess Rulipson. I'm here with my beautiful other host, Tom Hart. Tom Hart. And we're at the Sequential Artist Workshop virtual version. We're recording live at the time of this recording, but you might be listening to us on YouTube or Spotify or something like that. And we have friends joining us via the Zoom call in the chat and they'll throw uh, comments and questions in there, hopefully, or um, heckling, light heckling. We also accept <laughs> this week we're looking at pitching. How to uh, tell people you're working on something and ask them to give you money for it, I think is what pitching <laughs> Wow. Actually, you already threw me because I didn't think of pitching as, quote, how to tell somebody you're working on something. But that's a great, that's a great place to start. Yes, oh, if you don't want to make money, you can still, most of all, everyone likes to talk about what they're working on. But as someone said on the last call, we were talking about, I think it was the last episode, we were talking about ideas and how sometimes they can lose their magic if we tell too many people about it. So... Okay. You, okay. you kind of have you get to decide who you're going to tell and when you're going to tell and why you would do that. Um, but the three major points I, I wrote down, I swear to God, I did. I'm totally prepared for this <laughs> podcast pitching. I was trying to figure out a way to break it into three pieces because that seems to be a good format for our calls. So there's different ways to pitch, but also what what it is you what is it that you're trying to sell or send out into the world? Some people look at short form stuff and as a way of serializing longer form stuff. Or they just like working in more self-contained, shorter work. So we'll look at pitching short form work. I have more experience with nonfiction, but we can talk to really any genre. Then there's also pitching a book proposal. If you wanted to uh, work with a literary agent, or if you wanted to work with a publisher, or you wanted to maybe even, I guess you don't have to pitch to yourself if you're self-publishing, but um, it's, it's all kind of adjacent to like grant writing or, or things like that. There's always are opportunities for artists, and it can be a great way to meet other people and connect to bigger communities and bigger audiences. So it doesn't always have to be hyper commercial. But on that note, our third prong is how to make money and art. <laughs> and Tom has talked extensively, I'm giving a shout out to Jessica Abel's uh, uh, auto, autonomous, autonomous <laughs> creative, autonomous, <laughs> which is a rare type of cloud, <laughs> uh, <laughs> autonomous creative podcast that, uh, Tom was a guest on, and I, was it was the last year or the year before, a couple of years ago. It was about two years ago, and I remember midway through that call, I said something, I was talking about the certain kinds of, uh, well, certain kinds of dollar amounts, and I was like, but I don't, we don't want to get too much into that, and she said, Tom, this is a podcast about money. I was like, oh, is it? Oh, God, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. I, I think there's also been a movement, it's probably been going on for a while, but, uh, you know, as we live in a capitalist society, uh, we're often encouraged to not talk about how much money our employers pay us um, and not share that info with other people in any kind of um, workspace. So um, <laughs> the, the one, <laughs> uh, I have a funny story about that. I had a student in the pre-college program at the School of Visual Arts ask me about what's a career in cartooning like? And I think this is like the first comic they had ever made. And it was really beautiful. And they only had like one page left ink. And uh, it was a story about a mermaid. It was really gorgeous. And uh, I was like, maybe a little too honest. I was like, well, I'm on, um, you know, like subsidized healthcare, like whatever, not uh, Medicare, but Medicaid. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm on Medicaid, but I don't have food stamps. And I made like $10,000 last year. I, I really wasn't doing great, but I wasn't paying rent at the time. Um, <laughs> and then a, a little while later, I looked around and the student had disappeared from the classroom. And I went in the hallway and they were in the, I'm not kidding. They were leaned against the wall, sitting down, weeping. And they said, I just don't see the point in finishing this comic. <laughs> I think they might have come from like a stable economic situation. So I, I might have been a little, I, I mean, it wasn't dark about it. It was really cheerful, but I think I overshared. And 
<laughs> it was really cheerful. That's the crazy thing. It's like I was just like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean that uh that that hashtag comics broke me went live or viral last year, about about this time, I think, where people started saying being very clear about comics careers and comics contracts and um and things like that. And and that those kinds of conversations would help that particular student. Um because there are there are a lot of different types of careers, right? But this this hashtag was a lot about um getting a book contract on a tight deadline and like what that puts you through and what expectations there are and how little money you make per hour once you get down to it and all that stuff and how much pressure there is and stuff like that. And, and, um, so for a lot of people, they don't realize that like some of these book contracts are kind of like ordinary jobs in which it's going to kind of suck yeah. <laughs> and, people, and people are going to be like breathing down your necks and, and it's going to be stressful and you're going to be like, Oh, how do I get up in the morning? Um, but there, there are oh, lots of, yeah. Of and Tom, you were talking and, to somebody last week about the got a book deal and then they were miserable so I, I think that's the topic for episode seven is help I got a book deal and now what do I do so this is yeah. like ah so you want to pitch do you and then next episode will be like here are, here are some regrets <laughs> people we know have about it but it so, is possible like it's not the worst thing ever but it is hard right it doesn't like solve all your problems getting book contracts and things yeah like getting getting a book deal that's I kind true. of thought it would it didn't that, that's true of every media now and I mean artists and creators are just we're just content creators at this point very few of us are bankable in other words we get one project and we have to sort of try again every time and it's not that important the, the the producers, the people who are in charge of distribution and things like that, really not that important if they keep if we stay around. There's always somebody else pitching another thing that they can that they can uh, get on board with. Very few people are bankable the way like Neil Gaiman is bankable or something like that. Um, and that's but true. Be, that's true. Movies. Be, uh, true if if we're not bankable, are we still relevant? That's cool, right? Like... Uh, that's a question for another. Podcast, maybe <laughs> this podcast, but but I don't know. But why don't we go in order since you ordered since you organized this this topic and some questions in, in in some in sequence? Why don't we start with your first one, two, three? And oh yeah, can, and shout out on can... the mic to Sally. Sally gave us this idea for pitching last week because we we're like, what are we going to talk about next week? So thank you, Sally, um, who's joining us on the call. Okay, so we do have a list. It's true. The first item being like, how do you pitch short form stuff? So um, I come from a background of doing mostly nonfiction stuff. And I had the dream in my heart to make a graphic novel length work that I thought it might, maybe it's just because I studied illustration and had the mentality of someone who wanted to get published as an illustrator. And then I kind of failed at that. I was like, I'll just make comics. But the itch to get published kind of still stayed with me. I thought, oh, maybe I could pitch comics instead of illustration because it feels like it's easier to talk about. Um, and But I, it was easier to talk about pieces of a longer form project. And it ended up turning into like pitches of excerpts from the work, um, which I did have some misgivings about. I was like, oh, I'll just slap all these freelance projects together and then it'll be a book. And that wasn't the case, but... Um, where do we start, Tom? Well, Tom found a really cool resource this week called Chill Subs. Am I saying that right? I feel so old. <laughs> Chill well, Subs, if you will. <laughs> maybe let's 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 um, let's pull out a tiny bit, which is that like there are plenty and plenty of places that want to run things, right? Whether it's an article or an essay or a comic, and a lot of those are online. Some of them are in print. And we see some of them and we think, wow, I want to be a part of that, right? Or we think project I'm working on could have some relevance here. I wonder if they'll publish me or if they'll bankroll me or um, or anything like that, right? This, you know, before the internet or 50 years ago or something, there was only a handful of places. You'd go to the Saturday Evening Post or the New Yorker or Playboy or whatever and mm -hmm. try and, you know, and pitch them on an article or you know, whatever. Now there's a lot more places, but a few of them pay. But um, so, okay. 
there's still lots of places. So yeah, I came across this website called Chill Subs. I don't know how long they've been around, but they seem they seem to be of the minds that like pitching to literary places, magazines and things shouldn't be stressful. And like, let's make this fun. And it seems like a pretty cool website. It looks like a lot of work. Um, it, maintaining a database is the main part of, of a project like that. And so they maintain a database. I clicked through and found that at the moment, they have 271 places that take comics. Like that's about 268 more than I would have thought. So yeah. Is that short form stuff? Like, uh, I sh I'm sure. Yeah. That's what I was, that's the impression I got too. So, but so I this imagine is most of those related are probably, to our... They're probably literary magazines that are like, sure, pitch us a comic about, you know, whatever, or an anthology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also we have an anthology, the anthologies come out relatively regularly with the sequential arts workshop. We have one with the year long program. We have one with the graphic novel intensive, but we also have a working group called Saw Flow and Publish, and um, or Comics Flow and Pub yeah, Publish rather, and uh, that's a lot of the people that join us on the podcast calls are from that group, and they have an anthology coming up called Troubled Histories. Have I got all the info right? That's now? the next. That's the one they're pitching for for next week, which is late February, and they have, there's another one coming out called Where You Live. That's come. That's going to the printer next week or something. Yeah, and we wanted. Um, people to have the experience of pitching and getting published. And that's one of the things we're offering here at SAW. Um, in our case, you pitch an idea first. There's no pay, <laughs> but you pitch an idea first. And Emma and Carlo, our editors, um, tell you what they think of the idea and whether it's relevant to the topic at hand, uh, you know, the, um, the theme it usually is. And then there's usually one or two rounds there's usually a round of uh, thumbnails or pencils and then a round of finishes um, with some small edits here and there. Um, that may that may be right in the middle of the uh, the the type of the type of uh, editing you might get somewhere else. I don't know. Where every mm -hmm. it you know it, you have to acknowledge that idea of the long tail now, right? The long tail means anyone can make a magazine or a book <laughs> or, a, or an or an anthology or anything. And so the standards are going to be spread out quite a bit. The big, big, big publishing houses were the short head and the long tail. So the short head might still have some standards and some some particular ways they do things. But in the long tail, there's a lot of different ways. But you're the one with way more experience pitching short form. So you should be talking. I'm trying to paraphrase. Uh, I can do it. What you said in the, <laughs> I it. can't rely on AI. I just can't. I love it. some of that inner uh, transcriber in me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So all of my experience. How do I distill this into something meaningful for you? How many? Let's start. How many places did you wind up pitching? The variety of materials you've you've where? How many places have you pitched to and been and run comics at over your many years? I'm not. Sure. Like, uh, if I look at, if I can think of the places I've been published at, uh, it's probably like a handful. Like, um, Virginia Quarterly Review is a literary quarterly magazine that publishes comics and illustration and really gorgeous photo essays and illustrated journalism, but also mostly prose and nonfiction. And that was just an opportunity that came through another professional. So I didn't really have to pitch. They, they, they kind of proposed a project and they did it. And then we worked together a couple of times. Then I did later on pitch a shorter piece. But I think a lot of times, like most recently, the stuff that I've gotten published have been with clients I've worked with before in the past. I'm lucky that the art director is still there. <laughs> and also that they kind of remember who I am. <laughs> or at least I can provide them a link that's like, hey, we did this thing a few years ago. Did you still want to work together? So um, I haven't really worked with anybody new. But there are, but at some point, at some point they were new. That's actually a great way in is like yeah. pitched some places and then had a first time relationship with this editor or art director or whatever. And right. then they're at a working relationship where they knew that, like, oh, Jess, Jess is working on something. Let's run it. Or let's reach out to Jess even. This is like a really hard topic to talk about because uh, as like someone with a mind towards teaching, like how can I make this information valuable for people who want to learn about it. Um, sometimes me being a beginner at pitching was a little while ago. So some of my information or experiences might be completely different or dated uh, compared to people's current experiences. 
Um, and then also like your, your mileage may vary. Uh, so it's weird. I, I feel like the hard, it's hard to remember what it really feels like to be a beginner when you're a teacher. Not that I'm like some old timer, but it's just like, oh, I, I want to tell people how easy it is. And it isn't that difficult, but I think there is some luck involved. So it, you don't have to put yourself all on the hook for it. But, but I think at the very beginning, uh, uh, like, where do you even hear about this stuff? Chill subs wasn't a thing, <laughs> but Twitter was Twitter before, I guess it's X now. Um, so sometimes there'd be calls for entries on Twitter and I wasn't really active online, but people, I would have other cartoonist friends that were better <laughs> at social media than I was. And they were also generous friends that would share opportunities. And sometimes that happens in the saw flow and publish group online where someone will, usually Tom <laughs> or, or somebody else is like, hey, there's this call for entries that's it's not saw but maybe you guys would want to do it I don't even know if it pays or if it's any good so there are calls for anthologies that's pretty common we're doing it at saw um so I definitely got started there and I was also thinking about making zines to take to comic book festivals so I was already kind of practicing making short forms so I just kind of thought oh if I'm already thinking about this as a zine could I pitch it to this anthology most anthologies if you stay in the theme and make sure your files are to their specifications it's really hard for them to say no <laughs> so like I, it's really good practice and it's so fun because you you can get a copy of it or there's usually a release party or some type of celebration and you might see other people in the anthology uh carlo at saw just found an anthology uh submission i did years ago for josh bear's oh. Sus suspect device i think is what it was called and he was doing um Garfield and Nancy comics, I think. And uh, Carla, I was like, I knew this was yours as soon as I thought. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, I haven't seen that in a long time. So I think I must have started there. But in terms of fancy professional put on your resume type mm -hmm. of opportunities that aren't outside of anthologies. Um, yeah, it's usually like word of mouth that you heard that an art director was interested in comics or as Tom mentioned, you re you happen to stumble across a comic and you're like, wait, who published this? Ooh, they might have money. Uh, what's how do I figure out the art director's name? And then you kind of have to turn into a private investigator and Google <laughs> who the art director is. But sometimes if you know that person or know a friend of a friend, you can just ask them, hey, who the who is the art director? Sometimes they'll give a shout out on Instagram. I had the pleasure of working with so and so at, at such and such publication. And then you can find their social media and kind of send them a message. So I think this is all how those things came about. Um, Boston Globe, I'm still working with, and I think that's how we originally started working together. I'm trying to think of other places. I have been in conversations with other places that just I didn't, we didn't end up making anything um, yet. Like, but I know there are places that are comics friendly too. And then um, in the Chill Subs website that Tom mentioned, I haven't dug into it yet, but. I think you can even type in comics as a search criteria and find, like he said, places that are accepting submissions. But one sneaky way, like if if you look at my website, for example, and it has my artist bio, uh, I'm a cartoonist and this is what I do. And here are the clients I have. If at any time a cartoonist lists a, um, where their work has been published before, that's a great place to start, particularly if it's a cartoonist that you admire and you feel like they're working in a similar genre. Um, that's a good place because then it feels like less weird to to cold email someone you can be like oh I saw that you published this really cool comic by Tom Hart and I love his work and I feel like I have an affinity for the type of stuff he's doing and um, you might also like my stuff here's a link to my website it kind of goes like that let's let's backtrack and actually say that again I'd love to um um, first of all, in the chat, if anybody's got sp particular anxieties or concerns about pitching, I'd love to hear them. We can address them. But what you just said, you actually just put a sentence in. I, I want to hear the language that you use to pitch them a, a place cold. Oh, yeah, sure. So if, if we're doing it Mad Lib style, <laughs> where it's okay. blank. Well, <laughs> so my name is blank. I'm a cartoonist. And I, I was really excited to see. So first of all, you kind of approach it, I think, authentically as a fan of the work that the editor themselves are doing. You published a comic. I'm very excited, not only because it's a comic, but it's a good comic. So you're telling them they have great taste. And they're like, if you like great comics, you're going to love the comics I make, which sounds 
crazy, but it works because if you're authentically like, oh my God, that comic Tom did was so good. I'm so excited you published it. Here's a link to my website. <laughs> they can put two and two together. You don't have to say how awesome you are, right? And then um, and then say, you can even say, oh, I'm working on this book uh, and I've got some interviews with veterans. Maybe you might like, I have this story about a veteran who's also a forensic artist and he's really an interesting guy. Do you want to, maybe we can work together. So you don't even have to really say that. So uh, you could be as vague or specific as you want. Um, I'm not super, um, what are brave or like real, I don't know. There's people who are really good at uh, putting themselves out there. I feel like there's a word for that. I don't think people with a lot of bravado, like for Yeah, people, gregarious. Like, I'm like, yeah, I, I wish I had. The greatest like, thing, you really need to run this comic. Take a look at this comic. Yeah, right? Like, that's cool. <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> if that's you. But if if that's not you, you don't have to. You don't have to be amazing at uh, pitching to pitch. And and honestly, if you're just polite and brief, not wasting anyone's time. And the worst the worst thing that happens is they don't say anything, which is usually the standard response. <laughs> if they don't say anything, you've done it. <laughs> but better if better if they write you like a polite like, oh, we're we don't we're not really publishing anything like that right now. But let me know if you have anything else. Sometimes they'll even say. Um, oh, we're actually looking for science comics. If if that interests mm -hmm. you, let us know. Pitch us something. But sometimes they'll tell us that's not what we're looking for, but we're so happy you contacted us. Here's some more info. They'll try to steer you in the right direction. It depends on like how much time this editor has and how many emails they get. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find if you have a specific project in mind that you were going to do no matter what, it's easier to pitch because it's no skin off your nose if they never write back because you were going to do it anyway. But it's mm -hmm. nicer... Well, I don't know if it's nicer, but it's a different experience if you can work with an editor because it refines the work in a different way. It's a different opportunity, different experience. And it also helps you, like, I feel like if the, the someone was talking last week about if you share an idea too soon, it loses the magic, and then you might not have the follow through to finish making the comic. Um, this, if you tell someone, I'm going to do it, and they give you a deadline, and it's like, <laughs> you know, there's tax documents involved. You're like, oh shit, I really have to do this. Like there's no backing out. I'm a real professional now. So even if you don't feel like a professional or don't feel ready, you're sort of trapped, which I feel like is a good thing if you're someone who struggles to finish things like I am. Let's talk about the specifics of pitching a little bit more. Like, um, so should you send links? Should you send PDFs? Should you send giant, massive TIFF? No, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Just yeah. assume that everyone's email has like less than a megabyte of space left and they can only receive like messages in a bottle that are like text link <laughs> or, or maybe they've just recently had eye surgery and they can barely read. Like just make it as easy as possible to hear what you're trying to say. Hi, this is my name. I really love your work. Here's my work. Maybe you'll love it too. Would love to work with you. Hugs and kisses, <laughs> but I wouldn't attach anything. I think URLs are pretty safe because they don't add, they usually don't get flagged by uh, spam filters, generally speaking, if it's a legit website. Um, and then also there's no worry about you're expanding the size of the email if it's an attachment. A lot of people now, email almost seems too invasive to like very young people. Young people don't email as much as older people do. That's a generalization I'm willing to stick by. So people are like, email, that sounds weird. Um, <laughs> you could also send a direct message to someone via Instagram or, or Twitter. At, I know, there's ways to do it, like akin to email, but a little more public. I like emails because it feels more personal. And if I'm not really, <laughs> this is a really terrible example, but one time I was looking for a, th a therapist who accepted my insurance. And I, I the first time I emailed a therapist from like ZocDoc or something, I wrote this long like biography about all my problems and then they wrote back they're like sorry we don't take your insurance I was like oh no so the rest of my like oh I got to email like four or five other therapists I was just like this is my insurance are you accepting new patients send it was just it was just the info like I don't need to overshare so less is more seems to be a good idea I'm always just also really conscious maybe it's just because I'm a lady and I feel like sometimes women are concerned about taking up space but I don't want to waste anyone's time. I don't want to annoy anybody. And I just assume everyone's already at a baseline of being irritated. <laughs> so, um, hello, but 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 you have to try to not be apologetic, which, so I think in lieu of being apologetic, I'm brief. I'm like, here's some info, have a good day versus like, 
I'm sorry to bother you, but could you give me money <laughs> for my art? There's such a there's such a fine line between the being too self-effacing, too shy, too little, and being a little grandstanding. And like, like I know if I get a grandstanding email from somebody who's not like really appropriate for something, I'm gonna be like, oh. And then if I get a second one, if I get a second one in a week, I'm gonna block their emails from now on. If I get a second one in six months, I'm gonna be like, what a weirdo, another email. But then, but my mind knows that they're out there now. And if I get a third email and suddenly like the work's really good, I'm like, wow, they did it, that wacko. Person <laughs> that was so full of themselves and crazy, like they're really onto something, and that's way more than somebody who never wrote you, or, um, or was really shy about it or something. So I don't know. There's some. There's. It's really. It's really strange. And every and every editor and 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 other people in any kind of position of authority or anything, they're all going to be different. So it's really hard to know. That's true. And Definitely what be, I was like, what? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, don't be shy. Yeah. certainly don't be overly shy but go ahead yeah well while you were speaking I was like kind of looking in the chat to see what uh, responses we were getting from the audience and there was a lot of good stuff so Allison said I, I think it was Jay Scherer or Caleb and Roe they said that building relationships friendships not networking necessarily is key share info refer your friends they said it was the most important thing I think that's true and I wouldn't say I'm like BFFs with the editors I work with but um I've been lucky that the editors I continue to work with have a uh, genuine enthusiasm for what I want to try to do, and they want to support that, and not in the, like, uh, um, you're a poor artist, and we want to take a care of you. It's more like, oh, my God, this is cool. How can we make it cooler? And I'm like, yeah, so it really feels collaborative, and it's not, like, um, it's the dynamic, the power dynamic is really um, almost like a friendship where um, you feel like, I mean, you still have to be professional, but I also feel like I could be myself too um but also if you have people that feel more like a peer like tom's told me about calls for entries he's posted them on the network i don't know if i've reciprocated <laughs> i'm usually like here's a cool thing i read and here's a cat photo <laughs> but like i i feel like if you're always in touch with people with cat photos and for other reasons it becomes natural to share oh there's an art opportunity you might be interested in um it doesn't always have to be all business I think I have shared cat photos with some art directors also. <laughs> so you have to decide how how much of yourself how much of yourself you want to share or overshare. <laughs> I was going to comment though that like if you're talking about friendships and how um, business slash publishing um, connections become friendly connections, it definitely happens when you go to festivals and things like that. If you wind mm -hmm. up in the same room with an editor you've worked with or, or something like that you you you're it's it's a place to become friends you have things to talk about that um that are fun you have there's there, you just become friends that's what the that's great about going to festivals is actually being able to meet a lot of people on common ground and and share you know worst worst case scenario you just talk about good comics you'd seen that day but a lot of times you wind up talking about all sorts of other stuff and you realize um there's good reason to work together it's because you um, you have a lot in common. I remember mm -hmm. I worked for Mad Magazine. I hated working for Mad Magazine. <laughs> I'm get into that some other day. But like two years later, I ran into my editor who like I had this like contentious relationship with because they kept asking for all these changes and I was so annoyed. I was like, ugh, all this to get Mad Magazine on my resume. But I ran into I ran into my editor who now wasn't working at Mad anymore, and um. And I hadn't met them in person ever. I met them at a at a at a bar out at Mocha, the Mocha Fest. And, you know, it was just everybody was showing up at this place, having like fries and things. And we just got along really great. He was like, "I'm so sorry I put you through all that at Mad Magazine. I'm really sorry." And I was like, "I hated it so much." He's like, "I know." <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you kind of commiserate. Oh, that's so sweet. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, we got along really well. And and actually, I was illustrating a. a a writer friend's stuff and the writer friend was there and and it was just really fun to really just get together on this thing that was kind of a bad experience for all of us but a tiny 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 bad and like even that was a place where we could bond and get together and have fun yeah so maybe that's yeah you do this irritating thing and then um the pleasure of it is getting to know people uh, publishing is just another endeavor you know it's just another you know i was going on last week about us being creatures you know and 
I won't get into that today, but like publishing is just another thing people do. And so they like to talk about it. And it's just, you know, it's people do a lot of things. They go to ball games, they have, they do sports, they do yoga, they publish yeah. books and magazines. And then it's just yeah. like to talk about sometimes. It's it's also really hard to like, if it, it feels like it's hard to take that pressure off or like, oh, this is just the thing I do. Like I bake a batch of brownies and I, I send an, an email to an editor. I feel like um, brownies ask less of me than the bravery required to press the send <laughs> button. I have a friend who, if she has to send an email and it's usually like, maybe it's like a work email where she feels like it's sort of intense. She'll press send, she'll shut her computer oh, down totally. and like walk away for a few oh. minutes. She's like, I can't, I'll, I'll overthink it. And I, I have like, so, so um, uh, totally we don't want to be flippant, but also like, it's okay. Like try if you can, if you can levelize and normalize that they're like, it's just another thing. I think that is true. And on the other end of that email or that solicitation or the subscriber to your Patreon, that's a real person. Mm -hmm. I don't think the bots have, I, I really wish like if bots are, were around that they would just subscribe to my Patreon and yeah. give me money. There's no bots like that. It's always like spam bots that are, you know, like taking value away versus providing uh, value. But anyway, I digress. Um, there's a real person on the other side of that. And I think we we do crave real interactions with other people if we're going through the trouble of like, yeah connecting so um so yeah so if you focus on being a human or a creature uh then that's probably like a great point of reference and people will like want to talk to you jim had a good comment too on he said pitching as a nobody his word i don't think jim is a nobody but i get what you're saying uh is a challenge i feel like i have to create a resume so to speak before i have enough credibility to be considered as an actual cartoonist the saw themed anthologies are helpful and building a reputation. So for example, Jim could be like, hello, New York Times. It's me, Jim Hamilton. You might have seen my work in the Saw anthology <laughs> from last year. And if you haven't, here's a cool link to it. And maybe we can work together. Totally, totally. Um, but it's hard. Yeah, I think you, um, yeah, it's really hard not to tie in like, am I a real cartoonist? And do I sound like a real cartoonist to another person? And or my anthology experience is valuable enough to kind of pitch myself. But I've seen people try to write, um, it's essentially an artist statement. A, a pitch is a little bit like an artist statement. So if you've built yourself a website, or I think on Instagram, you don't even really have to say anything about yourself. You have like a link tree or something. But at some point, you'll be called to write about yourself in the third person. <laughs> if you if you do publish something somewhere, and how would you do that? And how do you explain yourself? And a lot of people talk about their pets and their spouses and their children and where they live and what their interests are. If they don't have, um, you know, publishing to speak of, they could talk about interests. So I feel like that's that okay it? too. I don't know why people do that. I think it's like a quirky writer thing. But... I do see it a lot where I'm on the back flap and it says they live with their three cats, one dog and husband or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. In Port-au-Prince, Haiti, it's always like some far flung place. <laughs> and they like um, baking. I don't know. So it's like some hobby. Uh, it's, it sounds like the intro for like a, a game show or like but Tom are you saying that... is a resident of Prague. <laughs> I don't know. Prague. Are you saying we do that when we don't have a long resume? That's in place of a resume where we say published in the Paris Review and the Virginia Quarterly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you probably shouldn't lie. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. I think when I was first starting out, sometimes you can talk about where you've studied. So you could be like, oh, uh, Jess is a student of the um, sequential artist workshop. Or you could talk about anything like, oh, um, maybe you do design work or something that's art or comics adjacent. And that feels good to talk about. Like, oh, uh, long career in magazine design and uh, I make comics and the, here's my here's a link to my newest project you really only need like three sentences and then you're off to the races just one more thing in the in the chat and then maybe we can move on to our second uh, topic sure. but Sally says uh, Emil Wilson said in, an, in a Sunday open studio something really helpful rather than seeing a call and trying to generate an idea it's easier if the call reminds you of something that you've already come up with so it makes all that stuff we create without obvious goals is we see that as resource building yeah, yeah. It's, good, sure. it's good to have a lot of projects lying around. I feel like that's way easier to pitch than trying to invent something from scratch. I have ideas that are half baked and I mm. kind of told the literary agent I, I was working with and I've, I've kind of told friends and it just doesn't have any legs yet. And I know it might be a cool story, 
but the window of opportunity is sort of shutting. I'm like, maybe it was just half of an idea and a few sketches and that's the end of it. So not everything. There's also this pressure to monetize everything we make <laughs> and publish it, if not with a publisher on the internet, that's publishing, putting on Instagram, that's publishing, sharing on the sequential artist workshop website, that's publishing. So um, it, there's this pressure to like keep, keep sharing um, finished work as quickly as possible. And I feel like that's, that sucks. That's hard. That's a hard way to live. I try not to do that. Um, what else, Tom? Should we go on the next topic? Yeah, next topic was was okay. uh, was book publishing. Awesome. I'm looking through the chat too. I'm like, Brownie. okay. Well, while you do that, I'll read what you wrote, which is pitching a yeah. book proposal to a literary agent or publisher. Parentheses graphic novels. So I think that's what you wanted to talk about from from the short form that we went to. So um, again, I'm going to just really quickly, and I think I'm going to I'm going to really quickly bring up the long tail again, which is to say that like there's a handful of large publishers that own most of the mediums as publishers. <laughs> and then there's everybody else publishing and there's thousands and millions of people publishing books now. It's it's unbelievable compared to 30, 40 years ago or something where anybody can publish a book. It, you can probably get it distributed in, in certain kind of avenues, okay. Um, you can certainly have it seen if you have the social media reach, et cetera. So, so we have to differentiate between quote big publishing and quote little publishing. And also I'll definitely be, I'll play a little bit of the naysayer and argue sometimes for self-publishing, but but go ahead. Yeah. What do you have to say on this on this topic? You're like, all right, now that we've got that out of the way, what do you have to say for yourself, Jess? I'm also yeah. just lightly trolling the comments again as as usual. Um trolling they're them? A tro a trolling, trolling, I don't know. Trolling. Not trolling. I'm not I'm not harassing anybody. I'm just like like <laughs> uh reading. Uh I'm not I'm kind of okay at multitasking. I'm really fascinated by the conversation, so I'm going to keep looking around. In there. Well, you can. Um, okay. Well, so long form stuff. I think if you so, I feel like this is the way I built it without a plan in mind. The way that it worked out was I started making zines because I wanted to make comics, and I was like, I can't wait around for Oprah to select me for a book club. I just have to start making comics now. And yeah. The way to do that is to draw it on paper print it out on a Xerox machine, staple it with a saddle stapler and go to SBX and trade comics because no one wants to buy these damn things <laughs> and split a table seven ways with like eight other cartoonists and sleep on the floor and just spend the least amount of money and just try to share. So that's where it started. And then once you have some of these things that start building, you're like, oh, another festival's coming up and let me see what I have. Or, oh, this anthology's coming up. What, what have I got? Oh, I had this idea. Maybe that would work exactly as uh, some people in the chat were saying. Um, and then once you have a couple of things out there in the world, you've had the practice of publishing with anthologies or maybe the delight of working with editors at on short form things, then you have this bigger thing. It was my experience uh, where those shorter form experiences informed longer form work and helped me visualize it a little bit easier. It also helped that some of the things that I had done as a freelance cartoonist that was short form was excerpted from the graphic novel I was working on. And I, I'm still working that way. I find that's really useful because it's a way to kind of beta test the material. And if an editor has like a suggestion you don't agree with, you can still do it and get the money and then be like, in the book version, it's going to be way cooler or like X rated or insert whatever you wanted to do. So that's been helpful. Um, but anyway, for long form stuff, I don't really... I, I think, hmm, man, where do I start? <laughs> I've, I've mostly done just nonfiction stuff. It seems like it's been serialized, smaller things that could be buildable and scalable into like a collection. I do think anything that even resembles an anthology is harder to sell. When uh, mm -hmm. I got a literary agent and we pitched the graphic novel of all the collected veteran interviews, it's 12 chapters with 12 different veterans. A lot of places said no. I think first, second book said no because it was too much like an anthology. And they were concerned about how to sell that. They're like, we don't think we could sell that. Um, so you kind of have to pay attention to what kind of books the publishers are making and then also see what kind of impression your project is giving. But ultimately, you want to make the work you want to make. So don't try to bend to be more publishable. Like, I don't think that is really... I don't think it could have done anything to make my book any more marketable. And ultimately, like everybody said no, except for one place said yes. It was, it was Fanagraphics. 
Um, but there are other places you, you don't need a literary agent and you can just go on their web website and look at their, they have submittable or some type of uh, submission guidelines. This is how we like to receive submissions. Here's what we do and we don't publish. It's probably on that chill subs <laughs> website even. I think a lot of that's short form, but sometimes um, there are places you can, you can even, it's silly, but you can Google uh, graphic novel publishers and Google will bring out uh, image comics. And then, you know, you go and look at the comic book store and see well, what are they publishing? You can talk to the people that work at the comic book shop, describe the project you're working on. Everyone that works at comic book shops are awesome. Or, or talk to other people that read comics. What does my work remind you of? Or mm. who's publishing stuff like this? And if there isn't a place that's publishing stuff like that, then you'll be like brand new, brand new genre. I don't know. But also there are places outside of um, the big publishers or even the small publishers or even uh, self-publishing. There's like university presses. There's itty bitty teeny tiny indie presses um, that publish like poetry chat books. Like sometimes, you know, they don't pay a lot up front, but they'll make sure they represent fewer artists. So they they try to market it as best they can. And it's just exposure to like a different audience. Um, I feel like that's super general. <laughs> Does that help at all? Ah, I don't know. You know, it reminds me because you mentioned Image Comics and I forgot that I actually worked for Image Comics once. And the reason is, I think this is worth mentioning because again, it's about friendships and things like that. But at one point, a friend of mine got an editorial position or maybe it was an art director position at Image Comics. And she's not a very Image Comics person, but she managed to parlay that job into running one anthology that she managed to get through them. It was an anthology based on Bell and Sebastian songs. This is Lauren McCubbin, who's the editor. And I knew Lauren. And so she was like, crazy, but Image Comics is going to do this Bell and Sebastian comic. So, so wow. like, you know, people who were her friends and other people were like, do you hear Lauren is doing a Bell and Sebastian comic for Image? Um, and uh, so a bunch of us were published by Image Comics. And this is a total digression. We're going to mention it because it's funny. Um, I did one page for that comic. It was not very good. I, it was, I've never done a good anthology page, to be honest, I don't think. Um, Leela, my wife, did, did um, sorry, I reversed it. I did three pages. It wasn't very good. Leela, my wife, did a one pager that was fantastic. It was great. It was a single pager. And um, for years afterwards, in fact, it only kind of stopped the past couple of years. For years afterwards, we were getting royalty checks. And I mean, in the in the amounts of like maybe $1.88, but I would get a royalty check for like three times that, which would be like $4.20. And my mm -hmm. comic was so terrible and hers was so great, but I got the bigger royalty check over and over again. Oh, no. But anyway, that's more about anthologies and things. But it was worth bringing. It was worth coming back, going back to that because, um, again, it's about friendships and, and relationships. And sometimes you can find weird, weird people in, in weird positions who suddenly have a lever of power that they can pull, and like sometimes, sometimes you can you can jump in on that. Um, but I want to go back to the book publishing thing. I'm not. I see the chat is busy, but I'm not really reading it. Um, but uh, everyone wants a book deal, and I remember when. Um, after Fun Home came out, it was pretty much Fun Home, which, which is what did it, which was what, like 2003 or something? Mm -hmm. um, suddenly, that's when the graphic novel boom took off. And we all thought it would take off sometime after Mouse. Those of us who were old enough to remember Mouse coming out in 1986, we were like, when are people going to realize comics Comics can yeah. be good? Yeah. And, and then like Persepolis came out. It didn't really exactly take quite yet. Um, and even like, you know, Watchmen only helped a little. And then, so we're all waiting and it seems like forever, but from 1986 to 19 to, I guess it is like 14 years or something, but anyway, so Fun Home hits and then suddenly all the big book publishers are like, let's make a comic. That's when I wanted a graphic, cause I'd already been working at that point for 15 years and I wanted a book deal so bad. <laughs> and I was pitching all sorts of garbage. I had no concern for what, people would want to read. It was before young young adults took off, but it was pretty obvious that young adults was, which is is where it was, where the, the industry was heading. Um, I just thought because I had been, I had such a long resume, I thought people would snap me up or something. And so I made pitch proposal, proposal after proposal, but they were all just junky, junky. Cause I was trying to, I was trying to 
figure out what the publishers wanted. I worked with a writer friend. I did stuff on my own. Eventually, I gave up and started the school. <laughs> Is it, what I'm <laughs> because, I, because really it was so advice. hard. Sorry, what? Really bad advice. If you want to realize your dreams, give up on them immediately. <laughs> because I wanted to be uh, an illustrator that's published on the cover of the New Yorker magazine. And I graduated art school in 2008 when the <laughs> publishing world was absolutely collapsing mm -hmm. on itself. And all my teachers were like, send them a postcard and yeah. they'll get back to you. And none of that worked. I sent out 500 postcards. The New Yorker didn't call me. I got one freelance gig <laughs> like three years later with a, a like an alternative news weekly on the west coast somewhere and I got paid like 75 dollars and uh it was awesome I'm super thrilled and when they that editor called to be like hey I got your postcard it was really cool did you want to work with us I was like what's your deadline like I was I pretended to be really busy <laughs> I was <laughs> like well let me look at my calendar and they're like yeah get, like maybe Friday Monday I was like yeah that looks okay like, and then I got off the phone and like ran around my apartment like that's so awesome but you have to like per I mean, wasn't even trying to be cool but I was like trying to sound like I was a busy professional illustrator and I absolutely am not but um some, some of the comments I was trying to figure out I don't know why I talked about that but I was looking kind of halfway looking at what's going on in the chat and it seems like a lot of people are like well what if I do this or what if I do that like different types of things like uh self-publishing um they're very good questions and I'm not paraphrasing them very well at all. So hopefully we'll be able to do that without going too long on the call that um, like I, I noticed I, I did an artist talk. Um, uh, was it last month? And in, when you get uh, opportunities to do something like that, you have to build, uh, we maybe don't have to, but it seems like the best way to approach it is to make a narrative thread through all the projects you've done to be like, from the beginning, I've always been interested in X, Y, Z when that's, that's not a, how life works. Like you, you, you're like a magpie or a hummingbird. There's all kinds of things happening and you're going from here and there. But if you, if you assemble slides of all your work or projects and then take a look, take stock of it and then build a narrative around that, you're like, oh, actually I do know what I'm talking about. So that can be like weird, good practice is to like go on your website or play like a folder of all your stored images of finished work and just talk to yourself about it and say, oh, this is this is why I started this and this is why I was curious about it. And all that stuff is practice. Um, like that's how you talk about your work. And then if them, that might be a clue to how to market yourself if you're interested in, you know, building a larger audience outside of the people you know. But I also feel like, Tom, you have a good point where you're like, I wanted the book more than I wanted to do the the comic or project or idea I had, I wanted, I wanted a book deal mm -hmm. um, more than anything. And I, I think that's valid, but a lot of people, I think that's why marketing is such a struggle for most people is because we want the outcome. It's not that we don't want to do the work, but we can visualize like this sparkly, shiny, gorgeous stack of money or whatever that beautiful <laughs> outcome looks like to us in our heads. It's different, but how do I get there? It feels like there's this huge chasm. So you, you might be like, oh, well, if, if I have the perfect book pitch, they, there's no way they could say no. I mean, to a degree, I thought, man, this is a really interesting idea to interview vets for a, a graphic novel. Not really a lot of people have done that. So you want to, it feels like a unique idea that no one had really delved into in the same way, but yet there was still examples of nonfiction comics out there. So I was like, I feel, I feel like my idea is awesome and it's marketable, which never happens. Um, but by the time I pitched it to first second, um, they published a great book called... Um, Alan's War by Emmanuel Guibert. And uh, by the time I pitched it to First Second, First Second had completely shifted to young adult titles, as Tom said. That's where the money is. We should all abandon all hope and just start writing uh, titles for fourth graders, <laughs> fifth, fifth and sixth graders. But uh, I, so they were like, no, we, we're never going to publish this. Even though they they were kind of the publisher, I, I thought for sure they would say yes. So it's, it's really frustrating to, um, even if you have an idea, and then you're like, this must be the perfect client because they published something kind of similar mm -hmm. to that. And you go and then you're like, oh, it didn't work out. Um, Jess, I want to I want to I want to bring up a couple points. One is that we're going long. So maybe we should make a, a part two. We should where, make a part two. That's let's, really get into book, let's get into book publishing next um, next week, maybe or some other week. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting things in the chat, especially a little bit about yeah. self-promotion, which I'd like to address and the third thing is I want to mention, because it's very much in keeping what we're talking about, but the whole reason I know Jess 
And the whole reason I hired Jess is because Jess submitted to a grant that we were giving out at SAW, a measly $500. And Jess, and I don't remember what year this was, 2012 or something maybe, right? That's and right. Uh, yeah, and um, and so at the time we were we would get, we would give out two five hundred dollar grants, and we had uh, and we would get maybe thirty submissions or something. We it'd be really hard to winnow it down to two, but that's how many we had. Um, but Jess's came in, and it was as good as what she she just said. It was, it was it was a no brainer from like we as soon as we got Jess's, it was like that's one. And then we had to figure out who the other one was. And I don't remember how we did it, but, but you're at the, at that point we were quote gatekeepers or whatever, you know, we had $500, <laughs> but you saw the call for proposals, which was like, we're going to give out some money and we'd love you to propose something. And um, you saw it, you pitched it with your best material. And we happened to be the weirdos or not weirdos because I, I think we're the sane ones, but we, ha we happened to be the people who saw the value in your work. But you just said like, first second wasn't believing it nobody was buying it etc cetera, etc cetera. so there sometimes it's just hoping for the right the right fit and um and we saw that immediately that that was work we wanted to support um and it was it, it very much in keeping with the kinds of work we wanted to to promote and and to be a part of so so and and now we're reasonably okay friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about that this morning. I was like, "How did I meet Tom?" And I was like, "So I'm glad you remember." <laughs> you don't remember? Yeah, that's how. There's I'm a photo somewhere. I'll have to do, so I'm gonna. Uh, I have a photo um, of me and Tom at SBX, and we're holding the check <laughs> for yeah. the grant. It was in an envelope, a business envelope, and he handed it to me. And he was like, "Here's your grant." I was like, "Oh my god!" And we yeah. took a picture. So I'm gonna look I for have, that. Um, I have that photo, but okay. Yeah, we. I'm gonna publish it with the recap. But that's, a, I mean, that's yeah. just another great example of it. Quote, it's not networking. You weren't being mercenary and just trying to get $500. You were pitching what you believed in. I was looking for people to work with or to support who we believed in, right? You know, and so now we're really great friends and we're doing the podcast together. So it's not really like, what I'm just trying to say is it's like, it's never, it, it's continuing that conversation about friendship and networking and partnering and stuff like that. But there are some things in the chat. Do you want to hit some of those questions? Jim's got a couple of questions and there's some others. Yeah, I, well, I was just responding to, um, <laughs> to Leonie being like, I feel kind of like an elder stateswoman at these festivals. Is it just me or does everyone look like they're 13 years old? I was like, I also feel that way when I went to SPX. No, no, what was it? Mocha Fest last year. <laughs> God, we, I was very briefly at the saw table. I had a delightful time with Carlo and someone else, man, I'm really bad with names. We had a really, really great time, but we, we we've just been at the uh, party too long or something. Like we're not even that old. We haven't even been making comics that long, but we were standing there. We're friendly. We were getting email signups, but we were just like, eh, like we, I just felt so uh, calcified because <laughs> there were all these dewy faced uh, young people with very cool outfits, just just hordes of people running by, and and so excited, and I and it was a different vibe. <laughs> Me and Carlo, like, I want to. Um, we really shouldn't go too much longer. I don't think, but but we can talk about it, or we can let it go. But I want to go to Jim's question. It says, yeah. If I walk into Quimby's in Chicago or some similar place, that's a comic book store for y'all, yeah. and they are really friend zine friendly and things. With a handful of books, how would I convince them to highlight me with an author event? Ooh. Um, and so to me, the answer to that is you just try and it takes chutzpah. And also there's going to be a lot of misery. I, I'm, I'm thinking of the time then when I, me, Tim Kreider and Jen Sorensen um, did a tour together. I wanted to have a book tour. I'd never done one. I wanted to do like a speaking tour. We None of us had done one. Tim was a great speaker. Jen was at the beginning of her like ascendant career. She's now won a Rubin Award and uh, her Block Award. Um, anyway, so we had to reach out to all these publishers. I'm sorry, uh, bookstores uh, up in the East Coast. We went, I think, from from Boston to D.C., and we wanted to find a place to give us to give a reading event all, every up and down the coast, and it was so hard. And especially DC, they were just like such jerks. 
And like yeah. we did every good reason, like we gave them a really good proposal. Here's the here's the books we're highlighting. Here's here's what the talk would be. Do you have any good dates that would work for you? Um, they were just real jerks in DC. Boston was okay. Like they were like, yeah, you can fit you in this day. I forget there were other ones where like it was a really nice fit. But so sometimes like some places are going to be okay about that kind of thing, and other times they're not. <laughs> um, and and I earlier Jim in the chat mentioned like you know, pitching to like libraries and things like that. And I just, I think that's a great place to start. Oh, and, librarians um, are such champions of car, uh, comics too. They, and sure. and they have, they really know how to um, plug in different things with programming. So you're not just some person rolling in like a tumbleweed doing a thing and leaving. They'll be like, oh, we could connect you with this uh, um, book club that is interested in this type of stuff that you're talking about, for example. I feel like they're really good with that. I And also the other thing is like, I feel like sometimes people say, well, if I, or the, the idea is, and maybe it is true, it just didn't happen to me. If, if I work with a big publisher, they're going to handle the fancy book tour and I'll get to do these magical big time events and I'll finally get the respect I so richly deserve. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't the case at all when I worked with Panagraphics. They were delightful, but they, even though they were a publisher, I, you know, they were really available, the, the publicist, I was like, if you have any ideas on what kind of events you want to do and where you want to do it, let us know. And I gave him a bunch of ideas and she's like, yeah, it sounds really great. And then I followed up like, how did it go? Oh, everybody said no. <laughs> so like they didn't only say no to like Tom and Jen Sorensen and Tim Kreider for their amazing three person book tour, but um, they said no to the publicist at Fanographics. And I kind of thought I would be immune from uh, getting no, but I, I had a big fancy graphic novel published by Fanographics. And I did a total of three book events. One of them was at the Brooklyn Book Festival, which was amazing. The other one was at the, uh, like at a convention for librarians in DC. And the one bookstore event I did was at Brookline Booksmith with the art director for the Boston Globe, just by pure luck. And Jim actually came to that. Thank you, Jim, for coming to my official bookstore event. So I, I thought, oh, I'm gonna go on a really big book tour. How many cities did you guys go to, Tom? maybe six or something i think that's, we pretty, that's pretty glamorous philly new york um boston i don't think we did providence cool. um and then and that i can't remember if we wound up in dc or not baltimore oh we did baltimore <laughs> let me in. Yeah, we're let me coming in. anyway but there was yeah, a, there's a bookstore there called politics and prose and we thought it was a natural fit yeah, but they didn't want they they were just like yeah kind of jerky um but I was going to mention it really, to some degrees, it really depends on how much you believe in the work, and also more importantly, how much you want to sell the thing. Like Jen, um, Jess is not like you sort of have to be Johnny Appleseed, right? You have to be like, I'm going to tell the world about my my book, which is how I felt in 2006 uh, when we did that book tour. But you didn't want to put in the extra work to like well, if Fanographics isn't going to get me a book tour, I'm going to make my book tour happen. You were like, oh, yeah. right. And that's okay. That's told you nobody, but- It was also like during COVID, I was like, if they're saying no to Fanographics, I don't think I'm going to have better luck. But I did think about it. I was like, should I? About COVID, yeah. But Jim, like, you know, if he wants the falling people to, to, to like get on the falling train and for the our, our listeners, Jim's book is all about people who have survived- very, very long falls. It's an amazing book and a really interesting topic. Like, but depending upon how much energy Jim had for convincing people that this was stuff they needed to read about and hear about, he could make more events happen. It really just is a matter of energy. And sometimes we don't have that much energy for it. Sometimes we want to turn it to another book. Sometimes we just want to rest. Other times we do want to play Johnny Appleseed and, and be like, this is the greatest thing. And I'm so excited to tell everybody about about falling or about the civil war diaries that um, that Merrick Bennett does up in, in Vermont or something. Um, there are a lot of people who are very, really good banging the drum about their own work. And it does take some, some amount of that. Sally said something really smart. Like um, huh? if, if, you, if you do want to pitch uh, a, a, an idea for an event uh, at a library or a bookstore, it's good to try to frame the experience as offering something of value rather than begging for support slash validation, <laughs> which is fair because sometimes that's what it feels like. But yeah, if you're like, uh, if you're if you're a patron of the library, that can be really helpful if you're already going to the library and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm an author and can we do an event? And here's the idea I had and it would fit in with this other program you have. If you're familiar with the brand of the entity you're 
pitching yourself to. It makes it way less awkward. It feels like more of an authentic connection. It's easier to quote unquote sell yourself. It's just like all around less painful and something you could theoretically get more excited about versus like rending your garments over. I mean, like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> Um, yeah, I definitely want to make sure that Sally's quote makes it into the AI summary. So I'm going to repeat it. It's good to try to frame the experience as offering something of value rather than begging for support, validation, et cetera. Um, Jess, I think we're out of time, but we have a lot more to talk about. And I'll let you organize yeah. how, how you want to talk about it in the next episodes, like when we jump to book publishing or when we go to a different, some other topic. But Yeah, that sounds good. And I'll, I'll definitely, I know we missed some really beautiful gems in the chat. So thank you all for putting them in there. I'm saving the chat so I can do our recap in the public feed and our, um, in our network. But also, I think this is a really, um, it seems like there's a really big topic we could do a sequel on. So uh, what we did miss in the chat, we could bring up for the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot here that the idea of validation is such a big part of this, you know, a big part of pitching. And it's one reason that it saw we are trying to be open to, to representing people and, and making people less, you know, more visible um, because there's something is, there's something so validating and having your work out there and seen and printed and in front of people and um, sometimes we think like we think we want the giant book deal or whatever, but really we just want to be like, hello, I'm just like, <laughs> we want some readers, you know, and we want some community and we want some eyeballs and, 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 and we can make that happen sometimes. It's, it's also okay if, if why you want a big shiny book is because you want to be a capital C cartoonist, then it, it can be harder for people to refute that. If you're like, yeah, did you see my graphic novel? It's on a shelf and it has a spine. And an ISBN. So there, like it's uh, it's it's hard. Right. It's proof. It's proof of your existence I, in the world. I got Before that too. The you sun know. expands and kills us all. Anyway. And I don't know about you, Jess, but like, because you've got an MFA and stuff now. But I've always, but I've no, like, I didn't even finish. I didn't even finish undergrad. I quit comics and to, I, I quit school to draw comics. <laughs> Yay! And then you made so, a comic school plot twist. <laughs> it's true. And I wound up teaching at the school I dropped out of, but. Um, but I was going to say that, like, like psychologically, I've always been trying to close that gap, right? Like the credibility gap. And so, um, so not only did I manage to make many books with a spine and graphic, you know, that are on library shelves and things like that. I was, I also did a book that debuted at number one on the New York Book Bestseller Book Times Award, whatever the hell it's called. And like, and then so what five, happened to that book? <laughs> and here we'll finish here. Eight years later, it took eight years. That book is now out of print and not going back into print. So for those of you looking for a big book deal, that's sometimes what can happen. So just watch out for that eight year. <laughs> that eight year. I'm at like the uh, two year mark. Later. So I told Tom when we, in, in six years when my book is officially out of print, we can have a party. We should, we should normalize. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, uh, we need to normalize all of that stuff. That's a great idea. Like let's normalize when our books go out of print. Let's normalize all these things that... But also let's normalize the fact that we want our books seen. So like maybe we, yeah. we share them in new ways or I don't know. There's a lot of new ways in which art is becoming, it's returning to its ritualistic practices, I think, rather than its, than its capitalistic practices. Like art is something communities used to share. Um, art can be a sort of ritual that that is part of growing into different phases of life or different sort of uh, identities and things like that. And um, rather than being this thing that you finally hit the jackpot or whatever, I don't know. I'm really rambling. I said, let's stop talking. And I know we I keep can... doing that. I feel like we're like at the bar and we're like, one more drink, please. And we're like, ah, I'm gonna, I gotta stop. Oh, I'll have one more. And so you ever, you ever like get a drink with somebody and they finish theirs faster than you, and then you want to catch up, and you're always doing this. Okay, so that's where we're. No, at. I'm always the slow drinker, and I'm always like, I I'm am. Not, I, like, how many is that person gonna have while I have this one? Yeah. <laughs> And let's normalize slow drinking. <laughs> uh, it was great hanging out with you. And thanks for the $500 in 2012. Um, <laughs> really You're cool. welcome. And thanks for like, you know, showing up with great work and work that not only was great, but work that you believed in. And, and yeah, thanks. And thanks to everybody in the chat for bringing your work here, for bringing your ideas here, for bringing your presence here. And, um, and let us know how, how we're helping and how we can all sort of build this this 
this normalization process, <laughs> how we can normalize all the parts of, of, of being a writer artist these days. Are we good? Is that our sign off, Jess? Yes. So what are we, <laughs> Join so us next week when we continue to ramble about something similar to this, I think. <laughs> AI is going to tell us. That's right. All right. Bye, y'all. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax deductible donation at the donate page of sawcomics.org. You can join our free community of comics explorers at members.sawcomics.org. Thanks so much for being here.